Will she feel the same way if you lose your hair? Sure. She'll just feel it about somebody else. Safe and clinically proven to regrow hair. Does she want you to use Rogaine? Better ask. For decades now, minoxidil has served as a popular therapeutic agent in the treatment of androgenetic alopecia, or male pattern baldness as many of you guys know it as. But also, it has served as a point of intrigue for dermatologists and scientists alike regarding its mechanism of action. At its core, minoxidil's direct functionality is to prolong the antigen phase of the hair growth cycle. However, the exact mechanism of action of minoxidil isn't fully understood. Now, it is believed to influence the potassium channels in vascular smooth muscles and hair follicles. And this particular action leads to several potential effects. It stimulates microcirculation around hair follicles by inducing vasodilation thus fostering an environment conducive to hair growth. Perhaps it promotes vascularization via the induction of vascular endothelial growth factor expression and activates prostaglandins to further enhance hair growth. Additionally, minoxidil seems to inhibit the androgenic effects on susceptible hair follicles and directly stimulate them by acting as an epidermal growth factor. So really, all of these downstream effects is thought to be coming from minoxidil's potential influence on potassium channels. Yet one of the most crucial aspects of minoxidil's operations hinges on its bioactivation. For minoxidil to manifest its therapeutic benefits, it's indispensable for it to be converted into minoxidil sulfate in the scalp. This biochemical conversion is orchestrated by the sulfur transferase enzyme SALT1A1, spelt S-U-L-T 1A1, particularly the human or homo sapien variant of the enzyme but I'll just call it for the purpose of this video, sulfur transferase enzyme. Without having enough sulfur transferase enzyme, or any at all, minoxidil's efficacy could be profoundly diminished. While some literature suggests a response rate between 30 to 40%, as seen in the paper, quote, novel enzymatic assay predicts minoxidil response in the treatment of androgenetic alopecia, unquote, by Gorin A. et al., However, a more nuanced picture emerges from an observational study carried out in Germany. Jan Rundergren's study of 984 male participants showcased a more nuanced picture in regards to the response to 5% topical minoxidil. The study incorporated evaluations from both patients and physicians regarding the hair conditions and balding areas. When physicians assessed the balding regions, it was observed that among the 904 eligible patients, the balding regions had reduced in size for 561 subjects, or 62% of the population, in the study. The affected area remained unchanged for 317 subjects, or 35.1% of subjects in the study. And for 2.9%, it did fuck all, if anything. <laughs> Regarding hair regrowth, minoxidil was perceived as very effective by 15.9%, effective by 47.8%, moderately effective by 20.6%, and ineffective by 15.7% of subjects. This sort of gradient of efficacy is emblematic of the curve-like response to minoxidil treatment, highlighting that outcomes are not merely binary, but spread across a spectrum. So it is the case that most people do respond to minoxidil, but not as hyper responders as we commonly see on the internet, but there is some sort of varying degree. And that would make sense because genetically speaking, the presence of sulfur transferase on your scalp and skin is a genetic factor. And some people have more, some people have less, and then you have people, most people, falling in that average zone, the middle of the bell curve. This is only 2% minoxidil. It's not even half as concentrated as Rogaine Extra Strength. That's why this black box is proven to grow more hair, thicker hair, faster than bargain brands. Only Rogaine has extra strength. So, if we want to supercharge topical minoxidil and turn non-responders into responders, or even responders into hyper-responders, it would make sense to look into ways to boost that sulfur transferase enzymatic activity on the scalp. This means we need the specific enzyme, the SALT1A1 human enzyme, present in abundance in the scalp. We have an old study titled, quote, Minoxidil sulfate is the active metabolite that stimulates hair follicles, unquote, published by Gerald A. Johnson et al. in 1992 for the Upjohn Company. This paper formally established that it is minoxidil sulfate to be the main driver of hair growth. There are also studies that show things like topical retinoids like tretinoin 
which boosts sulfur transferase activity on the skin and scalp, being used for non-responders to minoxidil and turning them into responders. And I've mentioned this in other videos before, but there are two studies of interest. The first titled, quote, Topical Tretinoin for Hair Growth, Promotion, published in 1986 by G.S. Bazzano et al. in the Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology, and the second study titled, quote, Efficacy of 5% Minoxidil versus Combined 5% Minoxidil and 0.01% Tretinoin for Male Pattern Hair Loss, a Randomized Double-Blind Comparative Clinical Trial, unquote. So, using topical retinoids like Tretinoin Cream before or after the application of topical minoxidil, or rather using a topical minoxidil solution that already has some sort of retinoid inside of it, could be beneficial for those who are non-responders or want to get a bit more of a response to topical minoxidil. But this also begs another point of curiosity. If we are to introduce the sulfur transferase enzyme SALT1A1 human to the scalp directly and then apply minoxidil, thus getting minoxidil sulfate afterwards, would that prove to be more effective or just as efficacious as the tretinoin minoxidil compound? Well, there are some things to consider. In the world of dermatology, the Dalton rule deals with transdermal drug delivery. The principle can be used to discuss the movement of molecules through the skin. The Dalton rule states that substances with a molecular weight below 500 Daltons are more likely to penetrate the skin. The molecular weight of minoxidil is 209.251 grams per mole. However, the molecular weight for minoxidil sulfate is 289.3 grams per mole. And it is well within the Dalton rule range, suggesting that it could be capable of penetrating the skin barrier. So this leaves the question, if we simply apply salt 1A1 or sulfur transferase enzyme to the scalp and then apply minoxidil, are we not going to artificially boost sulfur transferase enzymatic activity on the scalp skin itself, thereby getting more minoxidil sulfate, that particular active ingredient that grows hair? And also, minoxidil sulfate does have a molecular weight that would allow it to seep into the scalp and reach the hair follicle. So, again, why not just apply salt 1A1 or sulfur transferase enzyme directly to the scalp? Well, we do have some factors working against us. First, we need to determine if it is essential for the salt 1A1 or sulfur transferase enzyme to be present at the site of the dermal papilla which is the base of the hair follicle. That is, if we need to get this enzyme in a particular layer of skin, or simply have it present on the outermost layer of the skin, and then introduce minoxidil to it, then getting minoxidil sulfate to immediately sink into the skin, and that can thus be used to grow hair. Now, the reason why this is an issue is due to the molecular weight of sulfur transferase enzyme, particularly the SALT 1A1 human sulfur transferase enzyme. Now, this enzyme has a Dalton weight of 34,165 Daltons. Surely this is well above the Dalton rule. If the enzyme must be at the base of the hair follicle or somewhere near it in order to effectively convert minoxidil into minoxidil sulfate, then simply applying it to the outermost layer of the scalp, like we conventionally do with topical minoxidil, may not effectively work. And there is good reason to believe that sulfur transferase must be near the base of the hair follicle or somewhere in the innermost layer of the skin surrounding the hair follicle, as the current medical literature shows this. If we look at the paper, quote, Sulfur transferase activity in plucked hair follicles predicts response to topical minoxidil in the treatment of female androgenetic alopecia, unquote, from Jane Roberts et al., Roberts et al. employed a colorimetric assay, a technique that detects a substance's concentration via a color change, to assess sulfur transferase activity in plucked hair. This assay monitored the conversion of minoxidil to minoxidil sulfate, which was shown in a color shift on a particular gradient. The color's intensity, measurable through the optical absorbance, signifies the enzyme activity level. Crucially, Sulfur transferase, or SALT1A1, human, was found to be in the hair follicle's outer root sheath, and this would prove essential in predicting minoxidil's effectiveness for androgenetic alopecia patients. Furthermore, the study titled, quote, 
characterization of follicular binoxidil sulfur transferase activity in a cohort of pattern hair loss patients from the Indian subcontinent, unquote, by Chitalia et al. further expounds on this presence of sulfur transferase. So, drawing from medical literature, it is safe to say that SALT-1A1, human or sulfur transferase enzyme, has its activity relevant in the outer root sheath of hair follicles, and this can predict how well someone might respond to topical minoxidil application. So where is the outer root sheath? Well, the outer root sheath, or the ORS, is an extension of the epidermis and surrounds the hair shaft as it grows up from deeper portions of the hair follicle. The ORS is continuous with the epidermis at the surface of the skin. So there needs to be a means in which we can directly introduce this enzyme to the epidermis, specifically the outer root sheath. And microneedling may be a good technique to employ here. That is, if it is indeed the way to introduce SALT-1A1 human to the hair follicle. Now the epidermis varies in skin thickness depending on which part of the body you're looking at. But according to the National Cancer Institute, the institute states that the thickness of the epidermis varies from being 0.05 millimeters on the eyelids to 1.5 millimeters thick on the palms and soles of the feet. Now, the scalp itself is pretty thick and it varies between people, so I don't think it would be too much of an exaggeration to say that 0.5 to 1.5 millimeters would be the exact derma needle range that would allow us to reach the outer root sheath of the epidermis to deep within the epidermis itself. Now, extreme caution would have to be taken here so that scarring doesn't develop. So personally, I can't see a derma roller being used for this situation because of the very nature of just having to roll back and forth on the scalp and some people are a bit overzealous, and if you're doing that at 1.5 millimeters, that could present a lot of damage to the hair follicle itself. So personally, I would look into a derma pen or a derma stamp. And maybe not go all the way to 1.5 millimeters, but something like 1 millimeter probably would be okay. But that's just my opinion. Something that might be a bit wacky or a bit extensive would be jet injection. So a jet injection is a method of delivering drugs through the skin without using needles. Instead, it uses a high pressure stream of liquid used to penetrate the skin and deliver a drug. Jet injectors have been employed in the past for a variety of applications, from delivering insulin for diabetics to administrating vaccines. Now, Emzymes are sensitive, so it probably wouldn't be a good idea to just blast through the epidermis and deliver this enzyme where on impact it probably just shatters. So we have to look at much more feasible ways of trying to introduce this enzyme if we can even introduce it at point of it being stable. To effectively introduce SALT-1A1 or sulfur transferase enzyme to the epidermis using jet injection, the enzyme must first be formulated in a stable solution that preserves its activity and prevents degradation. That is without a debate. Also, it should be compatible with the jet injection system to ensure the enzyme's integrity. Once prepared, this solution can then be loaded into the jet injector, which, using high pressure propulsion, directs the solution into the desired epidermal layer. Ideally, upon reaching the epidermis, the enzyme disperses uniformly, facilitating its optimal function within the targeted cells. Again, the challenges arises when considering the enzyme's behavior post-injection, such as whether it retains its activity, whether it reaches the necessary cells, and also after it's fucking blasted, if it's even present in the appropriate concentration. And as with all drug delivery methods, the potential side effects of jet injections must be evaluated specifically for this process. And we would have to examine the potential systemic impacts of introducing a shit ton of sulfur transferase that could get inside of the bloodstream. So I just mentioned jet injections not because I think it's feasible, but I just wanted to explore a bit more down this rabbit hole. So how can we ensure the stability of the sulfur transferase enzyme? Ensuring the stability of enzymes like SALT-1A1 human for topical application to the scalp introduces unique challenges and considerations. In the context of topical formulation, first and foremost, the formulation should be designed to protect the enzyme from external environmental conditions. This includes potential degradation from UV radiation, 
pollutants, and variations of temperature and humidity. Using light protective containers, antioxidants, and possibly UV filters can mitigate some of these concerns. Moreover, given the oily nature of the scalp, it would be crucial for the formulation to be lipid compatible. This may involve incorporating the enzyme into some sort of lipid-based carrier, such as liposomes, microemulsions, or lipid nanoparticles, which not only protect the enzyme, but also facilitate its penetration through the sebaceous environment. Now, if it ever got to this point, in my opinion, then a crucial question would arise. Why not just put the monoxidal sulfate into a liposomal structure and then deliver that to the scalp? Okay, real quick, I'm here in post-edit. I was looking for, like, photos to include into this slideshow. What the fuck is this? This is $27,450 for topical monoxidal sulfate serum for hair loss. Be I, I, this is, this is crazy. Um, I'm not even sure if it's real or if it works because we have to ensure the stability of monoxidal sulfate because monoxidal sulfate is highly unstable in aqueous solutions. So I don't know if this is legit, but yeah, I had to chime in. But anyway, back to the video. And I did touch on this before in my video titled topical monoxidal sulfate. Could it work? The process of putting the sulfur transfers enzyme into a liposome probably isn't feasible. It might even damage the enzyme. So I think it might be a better direction to look at taking monoxidal sulfate and then putting it into a liposomal structure. Now, topical monoxidal sulfate is highly unstable in both aqueous and alcohol-based solutions. This instability can limit its pharmaceutical use, therapeutic effectiveness, and just as important, shelf life. So storing it in a liposome could be effective. So a hypothetical monoxidal sulfate liposomal application would be what we are looking for. It is also important to consider the interactions between sulfur transfers enzyme and other ingredients in a formulation. Ingredients like preservatives, fragrances, and other additives might affect the enzyme stability. Thus, compatibility tests should be conducted to ensure no undesired interactions occur. Lastly, while developing a topical formulation, considerations related to the aesthetics and the user experience are equally just as important, right? What if we have this liposomal monoxidal sulfate like thing that we apply to our scalp, but it's just this oily mess? That wouldn't be that wouldn't be good. If it's just this oily, greasy mess, nobody wants to fucking use that. So the formulation should be non-greasy, easy to apply, rather just minimally greasy or minimally like fatty um but it should be easy to apply and there shouldn't be any irritation ideally to the scalp this ensures that patient compliance and consistent application which in turn affects overall efficacy of the treatment can be followed through so yeah that's pretty much it for this video and the purpose of this video was to try to explore this idea of just simply applying the enzyme to the scalp and then applying minoxidil so we can just get that direct interaction to create minoxidil sulfate which would then help grow the hair of people who don't have enough sulfur transfers enzyme on their scalp so realistically i think the best option for someone to use right now would probably be to source out tretinoin apply it to your scalp the cream you can apply the cream to your scalp and then afterwards applying minoxidil or you can do minoxidil first and then apply tretinoin after the minoxidil has dried on your scalp we got to the end of the video comment green apples yes a random comment that i put at the end of the video to see who actually got through this whole video it was pretty long so i thank you for watching any portion of it but yeah thank you guys and the recent support that i've been getting has been amazing, and uh, yeah, I hope to see you guys in the next video. Peace out. I'm in Jersey City right now. Yep. I have no idea what part I'm in though. But I have a good view of New York, New York City right there. And uh, New York. <laughs> but yeah, this is Jersey City.